I had a, there were a couple questions from the internet, Mm -hmm. um, but I figure we could um, just start with kind of what we were talking before Mm -hmm. about education in general. Sure. So as as you're a dad now Mm -hmm. and you're thinking about education, having now, you know, been at Cooper Union, now on the board at Cooper Union, been at the Media Lab, and now kind of the shed interacts with that, you know, education and art in the kind of cultural way and and that its value. Yep. How do you think about higher education um, for your your kids in 20 years? Yeah. So, yeah, we have 16 years before my daughter is released from the American high school system (laughs) into, you know, who knows what, uh, really. Um, And um, I think that um, there are, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but there, it's basically 15 universities a year that go bankrupt in the United States. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is that m- maybe it's just simply um, the model as they have constructed it and are um, uh, sort of buttressing it to keep it exactly as it has been. Maybe that's maybe that's no more appropriate for education than it is for many other things in our lives. Hmm. You know, um, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's arguably easier to change the, the sensibility of a city, uh, than of, than of a, of of a university because, uh, cities, people leave, uh, (laughs) and universities, uh, the, the, the people who really, uh, determine, the the core sensibility of it are tenured which there's there are very good reasons for tenure and it it arose under mccarthyism to protect free thought essentially which is great um but um if you if you look at the downstream effects of protecting free thought such that then only the people who got caught in that particular net are preserved and the question is, what are the what are the what are the downstream effects for everybody else mm-hmm. uh, uh, within that, and how do you how do you structure for that? The bottom line is is that I think a- academic institutions. The bottom line is, is that I think academic institutions and cultural institutions have this thing in common, which is that what they what they provide you with is um, a sense of continuity between mm-hmm. you and some larger set of people and ideas Mm -hmm. um we if you if you didn't have cultural institutions and you didn't have schools in the contemporary united states there's not there's not that many things that are accessible to most people um there's a lot of abandoned churches um we don't work in factories or offices the way we used to so there's not the same sense of community there um so i think uh, the the role of these of institutions, whether it's the Shed or Cooper Union or MIT or or whatever, um, I think what they provide is um, uh, some you it, it, it is for the thing that they do is they pr- they force you to acknowledge that you are not an individual, um, uh, <laughs> yeah. that you, that you exist, uh, in some broader context, hmm. um, that hopefully you're helping to shape, um, uh, and hopefully is a, is a positive context, right? I mean, it's not dissimilar to YC. We were talking mm-hmm. about this yeah. before, but yeah. I think that that batch structure, yeah. even though they're so close together, you yeah. know, it's like three yeah. months apart between yeah. the winter and the summer yeah, yeah, batch. Yeah, yeah. But still, you're like, you know, I'm winter 17, you're summer 17. Right. Like, we're in the same alumni cohort, right. and that's awesome. Right. But I'm still summer 17. <laughs> like, right. I'm tight with people in that but way. I, yeah. I was thinking about it just yesterday because I, you know, I was thinking, I was thinking, wow, you know, I, like I have two friends who've never even met each other who just got MacArthur grants. And I have another friend who just released some beautiful, beautiful work like uh the um uh, uh frank lance who just did the the paperclip game that is oh so really popular right now right oh that's awesome yeah. um uh, uh and uh some amazing work from usman hawk and and I, I was just thinking what you know like i i it's not that it's not that i'm in all of their work uh a, at all it's their work um but all of their work is in me like i like like th- you know through my friendships and relationships with them mm-hmm. you know I, that that is 
that's what makes me who I am. I have, yeah. I have no illusions of, uh, uh, that, that the ideas that I have or the capabilities that I have or, the, or the, or the knowledge that I have comes from me and hard work. <laughs> it, it comes from, it comes from being connected and embedded with, an amazing group of people. Mm. Um, like, and is like, that through Cooper Union? Or it's through it's through everything. Life. I've had a I've had a really really peripatetic journey <laughs> okay. uh, in my life, and so uh, I it's possible that I've crossed through more industries and disciplines and so on than than on average. We don't uh, normally talk yeah, about this, but yeah. I actually think folks would be interested in you giving a little bit of the back, like <laughs> sure. connect, connect the dots in the, um, yeah, in the yeah. five well, minute I mean, you version. Know, the, the, the usually in meetings that I'm in, you know, it's like if, you know, I, I had a meeting yesterday with, uh, the Cisco hyperlocation crew and, you know, and we're talking about how to do indoor positioning systems and, okay. you know, and I was, and I was talking about signal attenuation through, steel versus concrete and this and that and and at a certain point the guy from cisco uh said you know like hey, you you know a lot about this so w w uh, what, what did you study and and this is always the punchline this is it's sculpture i studied sculpture <laughs> like and that's and that's actually the only thing that i ever went to school for was sculpture wow. um and everything else uh are things that i have been sufficiently interested in motivated by and or capable of attracting and engaging with people who are brilliant in other disciplines. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I'm working on, I'm working on a project. This is the last project that I have with MIT that I can't exactly, I can't talk about what it is, but it's, um, it's, uh, uh, I'll just say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very large scale artwork uh, that is, uh, that's using, that's using CRISPR. Um, and you know, I, I know fuck all, uh, <laughs> about how to get that done. I now know just a little bit, but what I, what I do know is I know how to work with people who are really good at their mm. craft. And I know, uh, I know how to connect them and I know how to draw out their best work i think i would i would say that i would say that I'm, I'm good at drawing out the best work out of people is that an innate quality or is that something you've cultivated i don't know i think i think i i think at a certain point i became aware that that's one of the only things that i'm good at <laughs> <laughs> uh and so now i now i i it now it's very deliberate yeah, um, but i but i think i think you know i think it comes from from really uh valuing what other people do you know mm. like I, you know i worked for years with with uh with frank lance when we had a company called area code where we i mean we i can say like we legitimately pioneered some of the earliest uh examples and 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 actual products etc in location-based games like you know when nobody knew what that meant you know mm. when you still had to pull you know, cell site signals off of towers, right? When, when we had to negotiate with carriers for, for location data, right? You know, we were doing all that. But the thing is, is, is that Frank was basically my favorite game designer, right? Uh, and, and I think it comes from really valuing that and like not, like it's, you know, it's not trying to, there's a difference between managing people and actually drawing things out mm. you know and i and i and i think i think learning how to learning how to learning what brilliant people there's an art to getting brilliant people to surprise themselves Absolutely. Um, and that is um that's what i that's what i try to do that's what I have tried to do in most uh, all of my endeavors and so, is that yeah. because i mean i've worked on a handful of projects with people that I think are absolutely brilliant yeah. and amazing. Yeah. And more often than not, it's because I'm like, hey, I, I have this particular skill set. You have this particular yeah. yeah. skill yeah. set. Yeah. I think you're amazing. Yeah. And, you know, so part of like the the sales process right. or the meeting is yeah. like, I'm just kind of fawning over you. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah, 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 this yeah. is super yeah. cool sure. and yeah. I can't do it. Yeah. Um, what did you provide in that relationship? Because I think certain people who, yeah. who feel like they can spot talented people yeah. also feel a little inadequate and a little like an imposter and they yeah. don't know how to add value. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think there's a couple things that I bring to it. One is, one is I usually bring 
the beginning of an idea. Uh, okay. or often I bring the beginning of an idea. Um, so, you know, for example, this, this project I can't describe, uh, um, is, uh, you know, I had, I had an idea that I couldn't even begin to articulate hmm. and I brought that to a pretty hardcore computational biologist that I know. And she turned it into a much richer idea and then, but it was also beyond her ability to do it but then you know it's like but then it kind of snowballs right then it's me and her mm -hmm. and we go and find the floral geneticist uh, <laughs> who can really pull it off yeah uh, and then so that's part of it is is you kind of snowball like you, you kind of like you find the person who can add that much to it and then the person who can add that much and then so each time you meet somebody you're bigger uh, and it's <laughs> richer um, and I think the other thing that uh, that I've been good at is, is that I can, I, I'm very good, I think, at demonstrating the value of whatever it is we're doing to, uh, somebody who has some money to pay for it. Yeah. Like just bottom line. Um, and that, you know, I think, I think people who are really, really good at whatever they do are often not in a good position to be able to do that because it requires, um, a level, a certain level of detachment from what you care about to be able to look at it from somebody else's point of view mm -hmm. uh, and to be able to tell a story about it that isn't the story that you tell yourself necessarily. Hmm. It's a true story. It's just not the story that you tell yourself. Um, and, um, you know, uh, in my travels, I, among other things, I spent eight years in advertising um, and I learned, I learned a lot about how to how to tell a story. Um, and I learned a lot about how, uh, how, how ideas can provide value hmm. basically. So yeah. now yeah. did you fundraise for area code? No, we just, Frank and I just bootstrapped. We just, we totally did that. It was, it was just two dudes in a room with some savings. Okay. You know? And you know, we were anomalous. We were, you know, I think I must've been, I, I guess I was like 35. Frank was probably maybe 38 or so, right? Yeah. Like, you know, so like totally anomalous, but it meant that we had some saving, you know, we had the savings that mid thirties people might have. Um, so we were able to, 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 to kind of like deal with it. Well, cause um, the, yeah. the question I was wondering yeah. is, um, if you had raised on the, the entrepreneurial side, yeah. um, much, you know, VC yeah. standard, yeah. um, versus, you know, raising at MIT, yeah. Or are you involved at the shed now fundraising? I am. Okay, yeah, I am. So yeah. how how does the story differ when you're trying to you know pitch a different product? People might argue with this, and I don't I don't even know if I believe what I'm saying, but I, I think <laughs> probably I would say that the that the essential story that you have to tell when you're fundraising is a story of scale, right? Like like because the premise of fundraising is is that the money is going to scale mm -hmm. and that means something else has to scale to produce that scale right and that and so that's that's just the bottom line right is is that is is that you're telling a story of growth and the best the reason that area code grew mm -hmm. and we grew to roughly 40 people by the time it was acquired in mm -hmm. 2011 the reason it was able to grow is is that that just we weren't we weren't trying to we that was just it just was not it wasn't a priority. We, we, we were just trying to do the best work we could do. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and we would just grow as we had to. And if we'd had to think about growth from the very beginning, man, we would never <laughs> have done anything we did. You know, we would, you know, we would have bet it all on, on this idea that we had in 2004 that we, we went and talked to, uh, to the Nintendo Corporation, we had this idea for Pokemon. We probably would have bet it all on that, right? right? And okay. what a mistake that would have been. Yeah, right. You know, right, right? Yeah, of course. Right. So, what well, ended up yeah, being the yeah. big success of Area Code? Um, Area Code. So, for, in terms of the the things that we did, there were a lot of there were a lot of like little successes. Okay. Um, like you know, and you know, we were Area Code was this very unusual beast, and I, and they're very. I don't. I don't think there's been many like it before or after, which is that normally if you want to make money in games, if you even want to make a living in games, you say like, 
I'm going to build a shop that's optimized for, uh, you know, AAA console development, you yep. know, which has nothing to do with the shop that you would build if you were doing like, you know, iOS development, you know, whatever, because the level of engineering and, and, and expertise, et cetera, is so intense mm -hmm. for existing platforms. If you think back to when we started 2004, everything was just fucked up. Like, the, <laughs> like, like it was like, it was like the very end of, um, of like flash based casual games, yeah. right? Like that was like, those were sort of tailing off and, and the console industry was sort of didn't know what it was doing. It couldn't quite figure out what the next big move was. And mobile just didn't exist yet in the United States. And, and so, um, it meant that what we would, we weren't a game development shop. Yeah. We were a game design shop. And that is insane. Um, <laughs> because, what we would do is we would just, we would pick up, um, technologies or ideas that would fall off the back of different trucks and we would hold it up and we'd say like, what, what does this mean <laughs> for play? Like, like what, you know, okay. So, you know, what is, you know, so cell site sector location, like that means you know that you're within like three blocks of this tower. Like, like what kind of a game would you build yeah. for that? Which is totally different when in 2000 and six maybe i think we got we got in the states our first phones that had a gps chip in them there was only one it was a boost mobile it's just a terrible handset and we had to we had to you know we were like getting j2me it was <laughs> oh god it was it was so it was so difficult and so awful it was it was so difficult just to get the handsets because the idea that like you know we needed like 20 you know for testing and the idea that there would be 20 handsets in lower Manhattan, you know, that, that, that people would buy that had GPS chips. Like we had to, we had, we would have to wait a week for new shipments. It was like, it was just so we would just every new thing that happened. Yeah. We'd be like, what could you do with that? What could you do with that? What could you do with that? And the reason that that's insane from a business perspective is, is that the efficiencies in that are exactly zero, right? Yeah. You had, you, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like basically you work really, really hard to solve all of these problems, technology problems, design pattern problems, all the problems of making essentially the first game where you're running through the streets, tracking your location. Yeah. Um, and then, and then we're like, now let's, now let's do a game about synchronous watching with TV and we, you know, <laughs> start like, again. It, we just, just throw it, <laughs> throw it all out. Right. Because there was no business to build on there. So we were like, okay, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? So the success of area code in retrospect yeah. is that we just, we would just arrive everything that arrived, we met it. And towards the, towards the end of it, um, uh, the things that arrived started to scale. And mm. the, the two things that arrived, uh, five years into our, uh into our, our project like like after five years of really kind of just like wow is it this is it this is it this five years in uh ios arrived and we were like oh we'll make an ios game and and then and then facebook games start to happen just really just just started to happen and we we built one that was insanely successful by early facebook standards mm. like like we're basically Everybody that we knew on Facebook was playing this game. It was called Parking Wars. It was a game about parking your car. Right? <laughs> but, it was, but it was brilliant. Like it, it came, it came out of Frank's head. It, it was, it was. Um, it's actually one of the. It's actually one of the the most beautiful games that we made there, um, and and one of the most successful. But the but so the the sort of accidental uh, success of Area Code is is that the because we met everything when it was new when two new things had unimaginable scale or mm. unprecedented scale that was that that they were that they were unlocking we became experts uh at launching into those unknown spaces and so that was uh that was uh, at that moment in 2011 that was very valuable to a lot of different companies who hadn't been trying to get into those new spaces because their game development shops. What they're trying to do is just optimize for what they know. Yeah. Are so, you tapped yeah. into the gaming space right now? Not, not certainly not in, uh, as an industry. Okay. Um, uh, I, well, I'm just yeah, curious yeah. what your, what your thoughts on basically the new technologies, right? You yeah. know, people yeah. seem to be bullish about VR. Yeah. What do you think? 
I think that there will be some great games in VR. I haven't seen one yet. Um, I think that, um, broadly speaking, everything that I'm seeing in VR games is basically done by people who made console games and where their essential mm -hmm. um, mode is thinking in console games. If you think about how long it took cinema to stop just putting people on a stage and filming it, you know, to realize that you could cut, you know, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, it really, it took, That's true, I, yeah. it, took, it, took, it took a long time, right? And then, when, and then when they did the first cuts, you know, people were like, wait a minute, like, I don't even understand. Like, yeah. what the fuck? <laughs> like, I was looking at a train and now I'm looking at a person. Can you put some text right? in yeah, between like, there? I don't, you know, and, and that moment hasn't happened yet. No. Which is, which is fine. It's, it's very early and, you know, uh, but, but that, that, that person or that company, I don't think has, has emerged yet. And I don't, I don't instinctively, and from my experience, I don't think that that person is going to come from one of the big AAA studios okay. um, because they're going to have to be thinking in a different way. You know, they're, they're, they, they just, they, they, there's no, I don't think there's, I don't think there's anything to be gained in looking at VR as a wraparound console, right? Well, when but, you, yeah, I mean, you just think about how quickly the tech, the technology outpaces the education, yeah. right? So, you know, I went to NYU and I was like in the English program. So yeah. you're doing all this creative writing, not at any point was there a course offered on how to write for binge TV? Right. Like, and now right. it's like a right. whole industry. Right, 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 right. Exactly. And I, exactly. I don't even yeah. know if any film school has something like that right, right. now. Right. And right. so how do you write a narrative for VR? Right. Like, yeah. I, I mean, well, well also, you know, games aren't narrative vehicles in general, right? I mean, they're, they're, I, there's a whole, it's a whole very nerdy <laughs> set of ideas around games and narratology, which, we're not going to get into, it. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, um, what, um, I, if I, if I think about it, actually having had a minute to reflect on it, I can't remember the name of it, but somebody did a game where you, it, this was just, it was just some independent developer. It was a game where it's for multiple players and one person is trying to defuse a bomb and they're oh, okay. and they're looking at that in VR and they're trying to do that in VR and everybody else has the plans and they're trying to communicate to the person who is trapped in a helmet basically right uh, and so the you know the game keep talking and nobody the, explodes uh, that's one of them no that's a different one actually that's a new one um, okay. uh, but it, but uh, yeah that's that's actually a, I think a, a modern instantiation of uh, of something that was about three three years ago okay. and, and it was very it was very raw it was very rough but but it was like it was like right like maybe what the the materiality of the medium of VR should include the fact that you're wearing a fucking helmet, right? Like, <laughs> like, you know, and you're in a room with other people, right? Like, like maybe that's not like, like maybe that's not something to write off. Like, yeah. may, like maybe that is, maybe that is like, you know, one of the essential aspects to, to, to play with, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the mm -hmm. fact that you can see things that other people can't see and they can see things that you can't see, right? Like yeah, maybe, you know, um, one of, uh, one of, um, the, uh, research assistants at uh, at the Media Lab uh, is uh, uh, Greg Bornstein, who's now uh, who's now a proper game developer uh, at Riot, and he did some early experiments around. He did a game called Case and Molly that was like the very first. It was like very early Oculus, okay. and it was like it was like one person with an Oculus, one person with a mobile phone out in the world, and they have a they have an audio signal between them, but the the person in the rift is can get some access to some information about the streets and vice versa, uh, and they're basically trying to negotiate the fact that they are separated. Oh, right? you know, okay. Which is a, you know, it's partly, uh, it, it's not partly. It is an explicit reference to uh, um, uh, William Gibson's early uh, Neuromancer, in which Case and Molly, you know, you know have 
in which in which Gibson was very interested in this idea that when you were in cyberspace, you weren't somewhere else, right? right? And 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 that a lot of things would be happening there, and that there would be some interplay between them. They're not the same thing, um, and the fact that they are so different is maybe part of what makes it so interesting, mm. right? You know, and so so I think there's, um, th I mean, that's just one example of like the ways to think about VR and play uh, in a um, in a way that's not porting um, conventional modes of interaction. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. then, you know, you, you spend all this time thinking about games, thinking about new technology, thinking about the future, and then an acquisition happens. Yeah. And then you somehow end up at the media lab, yeah. right? Yeah. And so how did that, what transpired to make that transition happen? Yeah. And then how did being at the media lab affect how you think about building products? Yeah. It's, yeah. That's a good question. So, I mean, so, I mean, the, the answer to how, uh, the transition to the media lab happened is, is super dull, uh, which is that they, they, they asked me to apply <laughs> and I applied and then they asked me to come and I came. Um, uh, I it, it I wasn't I wasn't looking for it, but also um, I I knew some of the people who were there. I was I was close with Neri Oxman, um, uh, who runs the Material Ecology Group, and um, and so that was sort of informed my sense of what the Media mm -hmm. Lab might be, and they had a sense of me in part through uh, through the relationships that I had, and um, uh, but it was an interesting, <laughs> you know, it was really interesting because. Then I arrived and, you know, they're very happy that some, you know, there's a new faculty <laughs> member who's very different. You know, there's, there's this, uh, you know, I was there for four years and, and one of the, one of the most interesting things about hiring new faculty at the media lab is like the, the primary criterion is, is that they're a misfit, right? <laughs> and it's like, we're, we're looking for, um, misfits who are thinking about how to ensure the heritability of uh crispr engineering um, <laughs> right right like because that's not a discipline that's a person right <laughs> and and that's actually what the media lab is looking to hire they're they're looking to hire disciplines that don't exist yet that are hiding inside the minds of a person mm -hmm. right you mm -hmm. know um and but so the problem is how do you like what is the what like, is how the do you call scout for that yeah, like, yeah, yeah. how do you scout and how do you even establish like what like what what anti discipline are you <laughs> like where does it go and so and so like the the best way to describe the way the searches go it's when I finally I didn't understand how I got there until we went to get other people uh, which is that you're basically you 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 know you kind of map out the spaces of of where all those thirty people are and then you just look for somebody who is equidistant from all of them. Oh, right. wild. Like, okay. You know, right? Like, like, you know, it's like if they're, if they're too close to this one, we have one of those. Yeah. Right. You know, and so, um, and so I think for, for the media lab, they, they were really looking to try to figure out games and play. Um, and that's what I had been doing with area code mm -hmm. for, uh, for seven years. Um, but it's also true that when I got there, they were like everybody was like I got there I got there in 2013 and everybody was like we are so excited for you to make keep making location based games you know and urban whatever and I was like but that's that's not research that's just that's just that's just going to be an industry like that like <laughs> it was it like I didn't know that that's what we were, we were doing in 2004 but it was research yeah 10 years ago yeah. right and like the fact that it's new to you doesn't mean that it's new, right? Like, and and if I was interested in scaling that again, I wouldn't try to do that there. And so for me, I came to the Media Lab to figure out, you know, they brought me there because I was, you know, somehow orthogonal to, you know, like, you know, the 30 different planes <laughs> that are represented there. Um, but I went there to figure out what was similarly orthogonal to everything I already knew and did. Um, so um, I did some uh, some game work and and brought in uh, brought in some some pretty brilliant 
uh, games folks, and uh, we got we got some we got some interesting work done uh, on games. Um, but um, I would say within within two years, you know, I had become just totally interested in uh, in in microbiology, <laughs> 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 and and that's what the next two years really looked like. Okay, uh, was um, was uh, was really um, sort of revisiting the 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 ideas that were underneath area code mm -hmm. for me, um, but not how would you express those ideas in terms of play, but how would you express those ideas in terms of biology? Mm -hmm. um, and I can't really say what you know. It's it's not a, there's no there's no straight path. I, I you know I could I could construct a clever story, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, but but uh, but it was it was instinct, and the instinct was was for the idea that cities are not as simple as um, hardware and a bunch of users. Um, that's just not that's not what they are. And when we started Area Code, the what was underneath it was we're going to build software for cities right mm -hmm. like that's how we talked about it in 2004 i think now that's a that's a powerfully banal idea right like you know <laughs> like, like like it's like a meaningfully banal thing to assert but in 2004 we we're like what is software for cities like what would it mean to change your sense of the city like and and we were reading we weren't reading we had we had well read uh all the work from the situationists in the 50s and 60s um uh you know people um, artists, primarily philosophers, um, who were looking for strategies to, um, to, to get you to reimagine yeah. the cities that you were in. You know, we, we, we didn't go into it to do Facebook games or, or any Parking of that. Wars, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were, we found something very interesting in that. But, but yeah. when we, when we started, it was because cities felt like something like, like that's a, at the time in 2004, it was like, well, that's something that technology is going to affect in 10 different ways. It's going to affect logistics. It's going to affect traffic. It's going to affect policing. How will it affect play? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I got to the media lab, um, uh, what I, I was sort of, I was, I was sort of digging underneath the work that I, that we had done and trying to figure out what was important to me about it. Um, like if I, if I were to reboot all these things and they didn't generate location-based games, what would they generate? Mm -hmm. And it turned out that they generated um, some investigations into the notion of cities as biological superorganisms. Okay. Um, that like, you know, to, to, to understand that, um, you know, if you, if you step all the way back and you just look, it's like, you know, you look at termites, you know, they make mounds that look like this and you look at ants and they make colonies that look like this. And you look at humans and they make these weird superstructures <laughs> that look like this. And you why? Know, why, why, you know, like, like what is it about, um, our, you know, essential trajectory yeah. that produces these things, you know, across, you know, many different cultures across long, long swaths of history. Like, like, what is it? And there's super interesting work by um, Jeffrey West at the Santa Fe Institute, hmm. um, uh, really studying um, cities as a complexity problem mm -hmm. um, uh, and really, really beautiful work about how they scale and so on. But um, through a series of very weird tangents, which is what the Media Lab is, is good at, um, uh, what I became interested in was, um, I had, I had a, I had a, 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 a hobbyist's interest for a long time in, uh, in, in the gut biome, okay. which is, which is now weirdly popular, right? Like it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like now everybody talks about their gut biome, but I, I was, you know, like I talked about poop long before poop was like a congrats like man. an emoji yeah. right like <laughs> right. uh um and um and and the role of your gut in terms of i i'm not 
so interested in it in terms of like your health and well-being, although I do care and I have a two-year-old. So now I think about it a lot. <laughs> I think about poop a lot. Um, again. Um, but, um, but what I'm interested in is just how it reshapes your notion of the world to know that, um, you know, you are a collective organism, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that, that, you know, there's all kinds of ways to represent this and there's always, you know, it depends how you measure things, but, but one way or another, the majority of the DNA in yeah. you doesn't, it's, it's not, it's not you, it's not from your parents, you know, and w much of it, we literally don't even have a name for it, right? Like, like, like where, you know, there are, there are species, um, that live inside us, uh, without them, we're dead, mm -hmm. uh, without us, they'd have to find somewhere else to go. Mm -hmm. Um, and that should change what we think of when we think of an individual. Hmm. And I'd been thinking about that a lot. And this is all a very roundabout way. The only way I know <laughs> it's a roundabout way to get to the question of if I have a gut biome that's distinct from your gut biome, does New York City have a gut biome that's different than the gut biome of Tokyo or hmm. Lagos mm -hmm. or, or, you know, wherever. Um, uh, and if those gut biomes are different, uh, why are they different and what is it, what does it do and what does it mean? Um, and in that the gut biome that we have, it, you know, comes through the exchange of material, uh, living material with the environment. Hmm. Um, you know, what does it mean to live in one city or another? It, you know, you are effectively in exchange with that city. This is why it's why you get sick when you travel, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's like, it's why you eat the food that, you know, in some city that you've never been to, you eat the food that everybody else there can yeah. eat with no problem. And, and it causes you problem. It's because it's because you are literally carrying your country, your city of origin with you. And, uh, and it's, it's incompatible, lightly incompatible with, the city that you're in. Right? And so and, seemingly yeah. this can, this project yeah. could have expanded, you know, like you are the hub maybe in the media lab or yep. your cohort yep. of people. And yep. you're like, well, I'm just going to go everywhere in the world now yep. and I'm going to do tangible scientific research. Yep. But instead you're like, I'm going to go back to New York where I'm from and I'm going to work yeah. at a cultural institute. <laughs> I did. Yeah. 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 I, I, you know, I think it, it's exactly the point. Like we, uh, I, for that project, which was around like the, you know, figuring out, a discipline that is now a couple of years later called urban metagenomics. You know, I amassed this amazing group of collaborators and some of them were like very, very hardcore biologists, <laughs> okay. like really, you know, the top in their field. And some of them uh, were like amazing artists like Chris Wobkin. Um, and we weren't trying to write a paper, you know, like we were trying to effectively publish a poem, you know, like, like the, we, what I was trying to communicate wasn't data mm. it was an idea mm -hmm. um and that um that is a very and that's and that's basically that's what that's what culture does right like you know basically um it 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 transmits ideas um and um rather than information okay. right and and you know in that distinction um it's it's not like they're in opposition but culture is distinct from information. Mm -hmm. Um, and the media lab is really, really good at information. Um, uh, and, uh, I had to figure out the right environment, um, for me, uh, in terms of how to be expressive in terms of culture. Okay. Um, and the, at the media lab, um, the way they, they would always, uh, we, we would always draw this diagram, you know, this sort of four quadrant, uh, of, you know, there's, there's artists and there's designers and there's scientists and there's engineers. And I don't know if it was ever explicitly stated, but roughly if you brought less than three of those to the table as an individual, you weren't, you're not that interesting to the media lab, right? Like I, I I'm overstating it, <laughs> okay. maybe even misstating it, but, um, but, but that model of artists designers, scientists, and engineers. And it took me a while to understand that my, um, what I, what I was doing for myself and for the media lab was basically representing the artist and design piece of that, half okay. of that and bringing artists, art and design 
I wasn't the only one, but I was bringing art and design to a scientific and engineering yeah. environment. It's not the Massachusetts Institute of Culture. It's, you know, right? like it's, <laughs> it's a, you know, it's like fundamentally, it's right? It's technology. Um, uh, but to bring art and design, uh, into that, uh, you know, with the deliberate, uh, goal of, uh, finding the, finding, finding out how to blur those boundaries or eliminate mm -hmm. those boundaries. Um, I understand my role here at the shed and I, and I say it explicitly is basically bringing the science and engineering back. Um, you know, this is essentially, uh, an art it's, it's a, it's a cultural environment. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's not really design, it's art. Um, but, uh, figuring out how science and engineering play a meaningful role, yeah. uh, and have meaningful forms of expression, uh, uh, within, within culture, uh, is it's like, it's, it's, it's basically the inverse of what my job was uh, at the media <laughs> lab. Um, uh, it's, it's nice to be home in New York. Of course. Um, yeah. uh, and also, um, uh, the opportunity, this is the first cultural center, the shed, the shed is the first cultural center to be uh, at scale to be built in New York city since Lincoln center. Okay. Wow. Which it, is one. 60s okay i guess it's embarrassing i don't know but but uh, roughly but yeah like it's it's at least 50 years ago okay um and uh and so the opportunity to literally be part of that process of building the institution yeah um is too good to pass up i, I you know i'm really uh i mean i'm uh, i'm good at the beginnings of stuff right <laughs> like like uh, you know um uh, and this is the beginning, you know, yeah. this is an instant, it, the building is still under construction. Um, so, so, um, so part of it is, is that it's the opportunity to just, to just, it's the, it's, it's the, it's a, it's a new cultural institution for New York city. You, you'd be crazy to pass that up. But also part of it was the opportunity to work with Alex Poots, the artistic director who prior to this had been the artistic director of the armory, um, and had done, um, a bunch of shows there that on paper are obviously bad ideas. Okay. Uh, and then you would go and, and they were just, they were, they were unbelievable shows, you know, like, and, and does that mean uh, curator yeah. effectively? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's a, yeah. In, we yeah, are for performance, you would call it, you, they call it programming, which means something different here. Oh, than okay. Elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. I just want but to yeah, know what yeah, the actual yeah, yeah, job yeah, is. Yeah. We have producers and programmers, but they don't do what you think they do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I didn't even realize that he was sort of like the secret, hmm. uh, uh, brain behind yeah. some of my favorite things. You know, I, I, you know, it was years ago. It was, it was actually four years ago, uh, uh, just recently. Um, a show that was the filmmaker Adam Curtis uh, versus Massive Attack uh, playing live. An obviously terrible, terrible idea. Um, and it was, it was so beautiful. It was, it was so extraordinary and it was, um, it was legitimately risky. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it is, it's just so rare that, I mean, these days it's just so rare that anybody takes an authentic risk of any kind. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's maybe even especially true in culture. You know, I think, you know, especially, you know, like large scale cultural institutions are weirdly risk averse, uh, mm -hmm. to my mind, uh, these days. And so the opportunity to work with Alex and the opportunity to work at the very beginning mm -hmm. of this thing, the building is designed, uh, by Diller Scafidio and Renfro, Liz Diller, and also the Rockwell group. Um, Liz Diller, uh, is an old friend and, uh, uh, and, and one of my heroes, um, she's the architect who did the high line among oh, other cool. things. Right. And, okay. it's, it, and the shed is right on the high line. And, you know, they, she came up with the idea of a building that moves, um, yeah. you know, and, um, it's one thing to, to come up with that idea and kind of like sketch it and whatever. <laughs> and but like, uh, you know, like they're actually, we're, you know, like we're building it, like we, we moved it. Uh, uh, about a month ago for the first time and nobody, nobody got killed. Eight million, <laughs> eight million pounds moved at about 12 miles an hour. Uh, and, uh, and nobody died. It's amazing. It yeah, is, yeah. It kind of looks like, like a concept car that actually made it to production. <laughs> and like, yeah. It's cool. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's well said. I, I knew. <laughs> and, and also, uh, I took a tour recently, uh, um, 
uh, with with some pretty hardcore folks uh, from NASA, some, oh, some cool. Voyager engineers. And we were sitting up top looking at the motors that move the building. And uh, and and one of them said, like, you know, this is this is ambitious. <laughs> and it's like it's like if you're the systems integrator on the Voyager yeah. and, and you're looking at a building and you and you call it ambitious, that's an ambitious building. Yeah, right. So cool. it's an ambitious building. Um and it is tabula rasa. Yeah. Um and it also has this very weird quality. I didn't realize how strange it was until I started working here about four months ago, which is that it's a it's an exhibition space of uh, five stories, three enormous galleries, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like white box galleries, really large, um, and then a very large performance space, uh, and then two small theaters. Um, and Alex, when I first came in, said, you have to understand this is very unusual. It's basically never done that you have a combination, large scale performance space and exhibition space. And I sort of didn't take it seriously because it just sounded, but it, if you think about it, yeah, you, you haven't been in a place like that. Like you're not going to go see opera at MoMA. Right. You're not going to go see an exhibition at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Right. Um, those things are, they're never going to happen. They couldn't happen even if they wanted them to happen <laughs> because they are built around doing the thing that they do. So it took me a while to realize that it's, um, that it's, that it really is unusual. Then I had to understand why you would even want that. Um, and there's a couple different answers, but the most valuable answer I think is mm -hmm. it's what allows us to, you don't start with a format, mm -hmm. you start with an artist or hmm. you start with an idea hmm. and then you figure out like, what does that become? And that, uh, that will produce new forms. Um, and like, and I'm, I'm down for that. Like, like, I think, I think that is like, that is so necessary, so important um and so fucking difficult because yeah. that's the third part of it is that there's also a reason that nobody <laughs> has totally, built yeah. performance spaces with exhibitions. There's a spaces. reason no one made yeah. moving buildings. <laughs> right. Well well putting aside the fact that the building moves, it's also um like the best way to make it real, like how few efficiencies you get in having an exhibition space with a performance space is yeah. think about what it's like to get a ticket to go see uh, the you know Rauschenberg show at the MoMA, yep. um, and trying to get a ticket to go see Hamilton. Okay, now think about one institution that has to accommodate both of those, and what what is the ticketing software look oh like? God. Right, like like just, <laughs> like just all these like, like just that like, like and and that's that's like this big, yeah, right? you know, and like um, so there's a reason the 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 analogy I always give is like you know, helicopters float in the air and planes float in the air, but nobody is like, wow, it'd be a better plane if it also had huge rotors <laughs> on the top or, you know, it's like, no, they're, di they're, they're different. And they're different for a reason. And they operate differently for a reason. But our bet is that it's worth the, the, the struggle of, uh, of, of, of making, um, it's not just that the building moves. It's not just that the building is weird. It's that the notion of the institution yeah. is weird. It's like it's weirder than anybody knows. Can you uh, put yeah. the the risks you want to take in tangible terms? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, there's some. Yeah, some. I, some. I I wish I could tell you about the risks that we're going to take in the programming, which yeah. I, which I, I really it's two can't years do. out yeah. now, right? It's a year and a half. Year and a half. Yeah. There's going to be a show um, that is going to be. Um, it's going to be extraordinary. We might have um, to do round two at yeah, that point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, it, it, it's a show where I can't imagine how it's actually, it's, it's like if you're if you're setting something up and you really, you cannot imagine what it is actually going to be at the end, that's exciting and like that, like that's risky and this is, it's very, it's, it's very beautiful risky work with uh, an artist um, that I can't reveal yet but um, it, it, we are we're planting a flag okay. um, with the first show that says um, this is this is the 21st century, um, and it's not um, like it, you know it's uh, a, it, it's not it's not neutral, you know it's not uh, it it might not be pretty, um, but it's going to be important and loud and uh and and rich 
Um, so there's a lot of risks in the programming. Some of it is riskier than others. Um, but part of my role is um, there, there's a couple different parts of it. One of them that's very important to me is to start commissioning scientists to do work in the museum. Um, and like even the idea of commissioning a scientist is stupid um, <laughs> and, and probably destined to failure, um, but maybe not. Um, uh, but, um, figuring out how, so, so I'm working with a scientist. I also can't reveal, but one of my favorite living scientists, um, to, to bring something to life, uh, in 2019 that, um, uh, what we're aiming for in that is, is that this is a scientist who sees the world differently than you and I do mm -hmm. because of their work and everything that they've done up until now is trying to describe that world in academic papers. And instead, we're going to bring it to life. Um, and that feels pretty risky to me. Um, uh, but then putting curatorial stuff aside, um, one of the things that we're going to do is eliminate um, – uh, any form of paper tickets, right? It's basically uh, your your ticket's going to be your phone. Oh, um, cool. Okay. And uh, by 2019, that's 98 percent. 98 percent of the United States will have smartphones. You know, even Obama phones are smartphones. Mm -hmm. um, you won't be able to buy a non-smartphone in 2019. Um, uh, and so that's going to be your ticket. And um, it uh, it allows so. There's a bunch of things that happen with that, and and they're they're basically, m in most ways, just plain better than <laughs> right. uh, you know waiting on a long line and there's a window and like you know you've been to Times Square you see like people with umbrellas in the snow waiting for and it's just like you know what it's 2019 and we say fuck that <laughs> like, like, it's like, and we have no legacy infrastructure like we, we have no incentives yeah. to do any of that. So it's your phone. But now here's what's interesting. If all those people aren't online to, to buy their tickets or to pick up their tickets, where are they? And so now we have to think about that. And that's a problem that no institution has ever had before, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, uh, is if you don't have everybody who is waiting to see the show standing in the line, what are they doing? And we have some, we have some thoughts about it. We, you know, we, I, I only noticed it when I was looking at the flow numbers and I was like, I was like, Whoa, 200 people an hour. What are we going to do with the 200 people who are waiting? Like that? We yeah. don't have it. So, so, so we're going to be doing some things that it, it doesn't feel like a big idea to just have your ticket on your phone, but it turns out you're changing the entire experience of guests and it, it actually changes how we program the spaces. Um, uh, so like you tweak that uh, and all of these sort of a priori that you have for cultural institutions yeah. go out the window with it. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one of the big risky initiatives. And then the other uh, that I could talk about is um, when I first got here four months ago, the architects reviewed with me a bulkhead on the um on the 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 northeast corner with cables that were going to come out and a broadcast truck would come up it has a satellite dish on the top and the, and PBS or CNN or whatever they would be able to live televise the events mm -hmm. that we do in the shed like they do sometimes with the met or whatever and i just you know i looked around and i was like i was like guys the likelihood that in 2019 that truck is going to show up is basically zero, right? <laughs> it's like, it's, it's not, it's not absolute zero, but it's very low yeah. that those trucks are going to show up to broadcast a live signal from cables off of a satellite to television sets that people are sitting at who can't wait to see this. Thing. I like, yeah, I just, meanwhile, everyone yeah. is, could watch it from their phone on their like ticket device. Right. Now. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, and so, and so we, so we killed it. Uh, cool. One of the reasons is because we, the, uh, the architecture team had the insight to put in a, um, an unprecedented amount of bandwidth for a cultural institution. Um, it's, it's 
uh, it's the first time I've ever been part of any kind of architectural something where you, you look at it and you're like, yeah, that'll that'll probably work for the next 50 years. Like that's probably enough, mm-hmm. you know, like, uh, you know, where, where I, I, I actually can't figure out how to, how to max it out. Like, <laughs> like, 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 you know, like, like, you know, we could, you know, I guess we could mine Bitcoin. Yeah, like, I, don't, I don't even know. Like, I, I don't even know what we can do with it all. But, but, um, but what we can do with that bandwidth is basically do digital broadcasts mm-hmm. and that, um, the idea of doing, live digital broadcasts not incidentally but like as the core um ethos Mm -hmm. of what we do at the shed where this thing that we're going to do in the first weekend it's going to be it's going to be enormous but i don't know maybe in total over one week we'll be you know twenty thousand people will pass through those doors right and it just doesn't sit right you know, it just doesn't like that yeah. just doesn't, it just doesn't work for me. Um, and then you have, you know, whatever it is now, three or four billion, do- uh, three or four billion, uh, addressable broadband connections out there in the world. Um, that we should, w- you know, we should be thinking about it less of a building and more like a beacon, you know, mm-hmm. like this thing that emits a, a live synchronizing signal to everybody around the world. I don't want to, I don't want to put it up on YouTube. I don't want to put it up on, you know, it's like, it's not about the archive of it. It's about that at seven o'clock on Thursday, this thing is going to happen, you know, and I'm sorry if that's 7 a.m. in Tokyo and, you know, (laughs) whatever, like wake up early because we're going to have to make it worth your while. Right. You know, like like we do for the world cup, right? Like, like, you know, like I want, uh, you know, because what is valuable isn't just the performance and the event what's valuable is that synchronizing signal yeah and that to come back to the very beginning of our conversation that i think is the the most important thing that cultural institutions can do now is to basically provide synchronizing signals is basically to say like you know right now like we're going to gather together and we're all going to be on the same fucking page Mm. for like for the next two hours Mm -hmm. we're on the same page like for the next two hours our attention is on this thing but i'm here with you right like and to and and to be able to provide that feeling of being uh with people at the same time with the same attention um it's very very powerful i think it's generally unexploited in technology in general and it's definitely underexploited in culture yeah um, you know if you look at what technologies do and have done is they basically delaminate whatever it is that we like from its mode of transmission or expression or whatever and if we didn't if we didn't love that so much it wouldn't have worked sure. right but it yep. turns out we don't want to buy albums and we don't want li- you know, like, to like, like we want we want the stuff <laughs> yeah however, Okay, it's true, we do, but also we want to f- we want to feel um what it's like to be connected to in a in a in a kind of limbic way, like in a like in a in a in a in a synchronized way. And um so so we're you know, it's that's the it's the premise of theater. It's one of the, one of the core ideas of theater, but the idea that we will be a will be producing very very high end uh live cultural events for the internet constantly um cool. feels like well yeah that's that's probably what you would do in the 21st century but i don't know because nobody's ever done you know who knows no one's who, doing who it who knows right so we could talk about yeah, this infinitely yeah, yeah, about yeah, attention so, and yeah. like the separation of yeah. mind and body yep. in our work yep um but, you know, we've been going for like almost an hour now. Okay, and yeah. so I just kind of wanted to wrap up with one yeah. question about you in yeah, particular. Yeah. Um, you've done so many interesting and seemingly different but mm-hmm. connected things. Mm-hmm. Ten years from now, mm-hmm. uh, what are you working toward to <laughs> make make Kevin better? I hope ten years from now I'm actually still here at the shed. Um, and that, you know... There were there were some things 
I liked okay about advertising. When I worked in advertising for eight years, there were a bunch of things I hated about it. <laughs> but there was one thing that I really loved and I was so afraid to leave advertising because I loved this thing so much. And this thing was, I had no idea what I was going to do tomorrow, right? Like, you know, you know, you'd be working on like some breakfast cereal account. This is like a real thing that happened. You know, it's like you're working on breakfast cereal and you're like there until eight o'clock at night because advertising is hard. And, and then you come in the next day and they're like, no, you know what? Actually, you're on the F-22 fighter bomber account. <laughs> and, and it was like, it was like, wow, like now I have to learn everything about yeah. fighter bombers and how people in Congress buy them, you know? Um, and, and I thought when I left advertising, I was going to give up on living a life in which every day I've got to figure out something new that we've never figured out before. And somehow that, uh, I, I think the, the, the projects and positions and, um, uh, even types of companies that, uh, I've, uh, uh, been part of making, um, they all have that in common. Mm. And I think I, like, I sort of don't care what I'm doing in 10 years as long as I, as long as I get to, you know, exercise that muscle. I, I think, at a certain point, I had to abandon the notion that I would ever have legitimate domain expertise in almost anything, really. <laughs> um, but that my but uh, but if I could figure out how to work effectively uh, and and with real capabilities uh, between everything as everything is arriving all at once, um, that that turns out to be valuable in the world who which was surprising to me as an adult um uh it turns out to be valuable in the world and also it's like you know i feel like as long as you're doing something for the first time you're still young right mm -hmm. and so like i just in 10 years i just want to feel young right so that's 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 my long i think answer. we should just yeah. close it right there yeah. all, right. <laughs> all right thanks <laughs> okay. man yeah